Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Leslie presents. And now your host, Paul Leslie. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our great pleasure to welcome our special guest, Leah Salonga. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Well, first of all, I think that most stories are best from the beginning. So I'm going to ask, who is Leia Salongo, and where do you come from? I come from the Philippines, which is a country in Southeast Asia. It is, um, <laughs> just in case not a lot of people know where it is, not everybody knows where it is or even how to spell. And I'm often asked, how many L's are there in it? One L, two P's. I started singing for family and stuff maybe when I was about four or five years old, but I went to my first audition when I was six and did my first show when I was seven, and that was The King and I for a local repertory company. And then I just kept on working pretty much in, in Manila, which is where I'm from. And then when I was 17, I auditioned for a West End show called Miss Saigon and headed to London to perform the part the following year when I was 18. So, yeah, I've been doing this a while. Well, I should tell you that I grew up in the Philippines. I'm not a oh, Filipino, but... I sure did. When I saw in your bio, I think it said Green Hills. Yeah, that's where I went to school. That's the city that my elementary and high school were at. Yeah, that's where I grew up. Excellent. Okay. Anyways, <laughs> this is about you. But anyways, uh, <laughs> I just wanted to share that. So tell us, for those here in the States that aren't really familiar with the Philippines, what was life like growing up? I do remember that when I was growing up, my parents played a lot of Osmonds, the Carpenters, there was Olivia Newton-John, I think. There was a sprinkling of the Jackson 5, that kind of stuff. That's the stuff I remember. I mean, I remember, though, my brother and I growing up on a diet of Donnie and Marie when we were younger. And I think my mom was – I think she had a lot of fun because they were like a brother and sister team, as were the Carpenters. She kind of got a little bit of a kick whenever my brother and I would sing together. So, yeah, I mean, we grew up with, with music in our household. But it, the musical theater stuff didn't really – start getting played at home, I think, until I was a little older. Well, tell us about when you kind of got into that, the the kind of stuff that is a part of your repertoire now. I started listening, I think, to musical theater maybe at maybe six, seven, or eight years old or something like that. Well, I mean, obviously, I had to listen to The Sound of Music, I think, when I was about five. So, yeah, I think that's when I started listening to it, but actually performing it, not until I was about six or seven, I think. And as for the stuff that I do now, that was not until I was a little older. I wanted to kind of go back a little bit and talk about the first album you recorded. You recorded okay. it at a very young age. Tell us about that small voice. This story is actually pretty interesting. I think when I was, as I was performing as a, as a, about an eight or nine year old, my mom had the bright idea that I should record music. So, you know, we booked a studio, we booked musicians, and I sang a couple of songs, and for you know to start out with a with a 45, um, as, as yeah, I'm I'm that old that I actually had stuff pressed on vinyl. So I mean, she shopped it around to different recording companies. None of them really thought that a kid's record would would make any money. So everyone, everybody from every recording company told her, no, this is not going to work. No, we're not going to be we're not going to be able to do this. So my mom, a pretty determined woman had a bunch of copies pressed anyway and then she shopped it herself and I mean she established a recording company and then she went from store to store in this place called Raon which is um, which is in Manila and it's like a row of music stores like one after the other so she went from one store to the next and then to the next with this bunch of, of 45s in the in the back of her station wagon and and so every store would buy directly from her and it got to the point where they were saying you know what we're, we have run out of copies would you please restock and and then I think it just you know that, then the album kind of came out of that because it was a success so we then recorded more songs and so there was it was an album of 10 and then we put it out and it made gold so we were very very happy about that amazing and kind of working our way to the present. You have a new album out, and it's called The Journey So Far. That's right. What yeah. do you think about the new album? Actually, I'm really, really proud of it. I was, it was, it was, it's a live recording of my debut at Cafe Carlisle here in New York City. 
and it was it was I, I really felt like it was a magical magical time. It was a really wonderful run, and I wanted to immortalize it in one way or another, to really preserve it either for posterity reasons or for release. I mean, you know, I guess my, my reasons for wanting to record it were more personal than anything else, but the, the recording quality was wonderful, and, and our mixer and master person, Jay Messina, did such a great job, and and everyone involved thought, you know, hey, let's, 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 let's get this out there, and so now it's out there. For anybody that listens to your album, The Journey So Far, they can hear what it was like to be there. But the Cafe Carlisle is a very interesting place. So I wanted you to it tell is. us kind of about the venue. Well, I asked, I think, someone in the know, exactly how many people can this place accommodate? And they said maximum maybe 90 or so people. So it's a really intimate venue. Um, it's, it's very small, and the the person closest to me when I'm standing on stage can literally reach out and touch my dress or touch my shoe. And I've, I've found myself, you know, in the midst of, you know, in the heat of singing something very passionate, that I'll see a little bit of spit landing in somebody's salmon, and I just feel so terrible. Um, so spitting distance, is, you know, so spitting distance, so saying spitting distance is very literal. Um, that's how close everybody is, and it's 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 really it's really great. The challenge performing in a place like that, because of its intimacy, is just how vocally naked any singer is. You're you're there. You have I mean a bit of amplification with the microphone, but I mean beyond that, there's really nothing that separates you from the audience. They can hear everything. They can see everything. So um, I'd like to think that it's it's a it's a real challenge for a singer to get up there and and do a set at at Cafe Carlisle, um, it's a bit intimidating. You know, you don't have a smoke machine or, you know, majorly colored lights or backup singers or backup dancers um, or, heck, even auto-tune that can manipulate your voice and fit you. This is, this is bare, this is, and this is naked, but it's wonderful. Um, and, and I'm really proud to have been able to do two series at, at Cafe Carlisle. Do you have a favorite song from this album? I think my favorite song would have to be The Encore, which is the very, very last song, which is your song slash Someone's Waiting for You. I dedicate both of them to my little girl, and now she's five. Her name is Nicole. I mean, she was three when I did that recording. Now she's five years old, just turned five. You know, she's an inspiration for me, and she's she's somebody that in one breath can make me feel elated and make me feel frustrated, but that's the nature of parenthood. But she's just, you know, she's a bully and she's full of life. She's funny and, you know, and, and she knows her mind. She knows what she likes. She knows what she wants. And I'm trying to encourage her, you know, to, to always speak her mind, to always defend a point and not to be afraid to argue with mommy. And, you know, because I may be right, but then she has a point of view and I have to respect that. And, and it's, it's pretty interesting, you know, to see her growing up in that way. And she's incredibly articulate. And I think that's just testimony to her being a pretty smart kid. <laughs> so, yeah, that would have to be my favorite track on that album. I mean, I love everything that, that was recorded. But for, you know, for very, very personal reasons, that, that's closest to me. I think my favorite track is the, the second one with Let's Fall in Love, the great oh, portal of the Harlem. Oh, my romance. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so, so beautiful. Well, how do you go about, I mean, most singers could name a thousand songs that are a favorite song of theirs. So how do you go about picking just enough for an album? Right. Well, it, it has to be pretty much a very democratic process. And, you know, I can't take credit for the song list or how the pattern went or everything because I, there was a team of people that really put this together. I had a director in Dan Kuttner. I had a script writer in Diana Basmajian. I had a musical director, his name is Larry Yerman, and I had these incredible musicians. I had, a, you know, John Miller was my bassist, uh, Jack Havari was my guitar player, and Dave Radichak was my drummer. So it was really a collaboration, and with me, Diana, Dan, and Larry, with the four of us brainstorming and thinking about what to put on this album and ultimately the show, it was like, yeah, well, let's do that, no, let's not do this, Leia, do you want to try this, you know, let's see how this sits in your voice, let's try this arrangement. And they try to push what I do as a performer, and they try to, you know, let's see if you can do this. Let's see if this sits well in your voice. And and so I always give everything a game college try, you know. And if something doesn't sit well, then, you know, it gets thrown out of the show. And if it sits really, really well, then we keep it. And there, everybody has an idea that may 
stay in, that may get thrown out. And, you know, every we all have to be, as a team, happy with everything that, that comes out and that is sung. Because if something feels ooky or weird, then there, there's got to be a reason why it's, it's ooky or, or weird or, or just sticks out like a sore thumb and not in the right way. So, you know, I will obviously fight for, thing, for a song that I believe in, but if, if something obviously to the rest of the team doesn't look right, then I have to look outside of myself and go, yeah, you, you guys have, you know, you guys have totally have a valid point. So it's, so I'm really thankful that, that I had a really great group of people to work with on this. And I had another series at Cafe Carlisle this year, and I worked with these same people. So we all kind of push each other in, in wonderful ways. So I've been really, really blessed with, with these three people. Well, one of the songs on this album, The Journey So Far, I have a funny mm-hmm. little story about it. I was playing it, the song A Whole New World. Somebody was listening and they said, you know, this singer sounds just like the singer in the animated film. <laughs> and I hope you can oh, tell all the it. listeners out there. <laughs> well, that's, I, thought that was, I thought that was interesting. And I think you could tell us kind of the rest about why that's interesting. <laughs> I just find that funny. But yeah, she sounds just like the girl who did it in the cartoon. <laughs> because it is yeah. the girl that did it in the cartoon. <laughs> there you have it, folks. Yeah, that, that kind of <laughs> makes me laugh. That makes me laugh really hard. Well, how did that happen exactly? Aladdin? How did that happen? Well, I was yeah. I was I was actually still in Miss Saigon, and it was a, it was February, and a bunch of the girls in the show were auditioning for this new Disney film. Um, and I was just like hearing about, like, I passed somebody in the hall, and they're like, did you audition for that Disney movie? And I'm thinking, huh, wow. I, and, and I'm just, you know, overhearing conversation in the hallway. And then after one performance of the show, there is a note on the, the stage manager's call board, like, a, like, in, like, our, like on our, you know, like our stage, stage door call board. And it had, there was a note from me, and it said, uh, Leia, we have been looking for you. Would you please give... Albert Tavares, who's the casting director, a call at this number, and I gave him a call, and they're like, yeah, we are casting for the singing voice for this Disney movie, and bam, it, it dawned on me. He's like, oh, that, this is the thing that, you know, everyone was auditioning for, and, and he said, can you come in? And said, sure, I guess so, and and I think it was, was it Valentine's Day when I actually auditioned for it? I think it was Valentine's Day. It was, it was the morning of Valentine's Day, and I went in, um, and I sang for Alan Menneken, David Friedman, Tim Rice, and all of them, you know, when I, I got to meet everybody, and, and they said, okay, we're all going to bow our heads down, but it's, it's nothing against you, okay, or anything. It's because we just need to hear your voice. We don't need to see your face. We just need to hear you. So I'm like, well, that takes the pressure off me and my bad outfit for the day. So, okay, sure. So I, I sang Part of Your World from The Little Mermaid. I, I figured, well, this is Disney, so I should sing something from that catalog. I opened my mouth and I sang it, and then Alan Menken went to the piano after I was done, and he he started moving it like a step higher, a step higher, just to see where my voice fell. And the next thing I knew, I got called in to record a demo of a whole new world. And not long after that, lo and behold, there I was recording it for real in in a studio in New York City with 75 musicians. So it was it was a pretty magical way of happening, and it happened really quickly. And the movie was released in November of that year. So it, it you know February of '92 we recorded it. November of '92 it was released, and it was such a thrill. It was oh my gosh, I think it was it was at the time one of the biggest thrills, if not the biggest thrill of my life. Great story. So tell us, is there anything on the horizon with your music? This album has just been released, and so. My thing is, well, let's see where this takes us before making plans for our next step. I mean, I constantly record also in the Philippines, and I'm always receiving original music out and, and to record. So, I mean, as far as my local career, local meaning Filipino career is concerned, I mean, that's always busy and there's always something going on. As far as my international career, well, then it's kind of a wait and see, and we'll, we'll see how this album does and, and go on from there. I have two final questions I ask all of our guests. One of them sure. is kind of lighthearted, and then the other okay. one is a little more serious. Oh, the lighthearted okay. one. Okay, let's do the lighthearted one. What is your all-time favorite meal? Oh, oh, okay. 
There's a few. Now, you you got to indulge me on this. This answer is going to be a little long. Every time I go home, when, I, when, I'm, when I've spent a lot of time in a foreign country, the first meal, which is like my favorite meal, whenever I get home, it has to be dried, stinky, salted fish. I'm sure you're familiar with it. It's either duyo or daim or dangil, which is Filipino. Oh, yeah. So it's got to be one of those three. Stink, the stinkier, the better it is, the more heavenly it smells for me. My husband thinks it smells like wet dog, but that's what you get growing up in Southern California. So anyway, it's, <laughs> it's duyo or dangil or daing, which is the salty, dried one, um, a couple of fried eggs over easy, and garlic fried rice. I have to have that. The first thing when I get home into Manila, that's that's just there's no there's no bargaining with me on that. I don't care how unhealthy it is, I have to have it. As far as favorite cuisine, I mean it it really ranges and depends on how I feel on any certain day. Some days it's like I have to have something salty. I'm not huge on on sweets. I mean I like them, but I can live without them. I love Italian food. I love Thai food. I love Japanese and Chinese. So. I think I tend to lean, besides Italian food, I tend to lean towards Asian cuisine. Um, and I'll, you know, I guess I'm much more adventurous with that sort of food than I am with Western. I mean, I like eating Western, but it's, it seems much more flavorful in the East for me. Hmm. Well, the final question that I have, you've mentioned in this interview a couple question. times about the fact that you have, yeah, that you have an international career. Mm-hmm. Well, the thing about this show is we have listeners all over the world. So nice. my last question, what would you like to say to all the people who are listening in, no matter where they're from? Oh, um, well, to those who do listen to my voice on a regular basis and those who have supported my career um, throughout the the many years that it's been around, I mean, I just wanted to say thank you for buying my CDs, my albums, for watching my concerts, you know, wherever that might be, whether it's a little room somewhere in in a city whose name I don't remember or, you know, in a bigger venue or in the Philippines. It just, it just makes me feel, it makes my heart feel really, really big that, you know, that there are people who, who find something in my voice that, that makes them feel happy, and I, I receive a lot of a lot of mail from a lot of people who say that you know your 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 music has helped me through a tough time, and you know listening to your voice makes me really happy. And you know this I, we sang this particular song of yours at our wedding, and that kind of stuff really makes me you know makes me smile. And and even just one person saying something like that to me, it, it, it's like oh then then this is worthwhile, and this is why. You know, this is why I make music, and ultimately it's to make just even one person in this world feel something, feel happy, and, you know, and I guess it's part of why I love doing musical theater, because you launch yourself into a journey of, of emotions that just go up and down and everywhere. It's, it's, an, it's an amazing ride that I, love, that I love taking, even though at the end of the night I'll find myself just completely exhausted. You know, at the end of it all, I've got this big smile on my face. Like Christmas is just every day, and so, hmm. so yeah. So I just really want to, you know, be able to tell people, the people that are listening to this program, just, just more than anything else, anything else, just thank you, thank you for, for listening to my music, and and for those who haven't yet, I, I hope that you know that there's something here on this album or any of the others that I've recorded that you find makes you feel something or makes you happy or even makes you infuriated you know I'll I'll be I'll take that and yeah that 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 kind of makes me happy if I, if I'm able to make someone feel something well I thank you so much for the interview and I know thank all the listeners so do as well oh, have thank a wonderful you, Paul. day I appreciate that thank you thank you my you pleasure too. No, no.